Aloha, everyone. Welcome to MTG 808 Junior. You got Mike on the mic, and we got Eric. Hello, hello. And we got the man himself, Sean. Howdy, howdy. All right, so we're coming at you with another video, but before we, we touch bases with you folks, um, right in front of you, we have our Facebook. Uh, we, just many ways to get a hold of us. Try to check out what's going on in, in terms of uh, the youth scene. I know there's not much right now given uh, our current environment, but you know we're doing our best to make sure we're giving you as much content as we can. Um, so we have Facebook, then we have our WordPress. Um, again, we're keeping track of what's going on in the youth scene uh, in terms of like sets coming out. Also, you know, a lot of this, uh, we give a big shout out to all our Patreons. You know, a big shout out to our Patreons for doing what you do for help supporting the youth scene, supporting uh, the project. And, you know, just, you know, if you folks are in, you're in the uh, Discord area, you know, if you want to get a hold of us or you want to talk, talk story, get in some arena action, uh, we do have our Discord. So, um, and it is a perk for being a Patreon. So please feel free, you know, drop a dollar every month and you give access to a lot of uh, content or you want to ask us questions, you know. Um, we're more than help, more than uh, willing to uh, help you on that direction. So, all right. Discord, Discord is also a great place to get a game of Standard Artisan. So, if you are an enthusiast of the format and you want a place to, uh, you know, find other people that are down to game, I know there's some MTGA events, but they're not always up. So, if you're itching for a game of Standard Artisan, hop in the Discord. Um, and also, if you have ever played in one of our tournaments as a youth player, uh, just send us a message and we'll get you that Discord link for free. You don't need to be a patron if you are a youth tournament player. Yes. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so we kind of touched, covered everything. And, um, yeah, uh, we're hoping everybody's been staying safe. Uh, we're hoping <clears throat> everybody's still keeping their magic grind on. And other than that, we're here to bring you our top picks for Core Set 2021. Well, before um, that, I think we should talk about bands, right? Yep. Yes, there have been some developments. Yep. Two, two, one really, really powerful card and one kind of iffy, but it kind of makes sense. Yeah, we were thinking about banning Healer's Hawk in, when, back when we were playing Popper, so... While I was surprised to see that that Wizards decided to ban Healer's Hawk in the Artisan format, it kind of makes sense. It's kind of just the go-to one-drop for white decks. Yeah, it does and... lots of things too, just being a flyer to gain life. Yeah, like this plus a Johnny's Pride Mate was really strong. It yeah. was really good to like stack auras on, so I could see how it was problematic and they just decided to get rid of it. Yeah. Probably opens up a lot of space in the format. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, so Healer's Hawk so, is now banned in Standard Artisan as well as Oh boy. Drumroll. Oh. Zenith Flare. Deal 50 damage to target opponent. No, 50 is a bit much, but... No, no, realistic. 50. I mean, the, the, the last time that they had a real Standard Artisan event on Arena, you could not play, like, three games in the event without running into this deck yeah. once, maybe even I, three I, times. It's an auto-include in every single um, cycle deck, too. Yeah. And yeah. There, are very few, there are very few cards that would, like, people would want to, like, main board, like, Graveyard Hate just to actually get rid of the Graveyard to make Zenith Flare worth zero. Or, like, uh, you know, Nars... Well, not really Narset. I mean, Narset just slows them slows them down from actually drawing more cards to get to Zenith Flare. But, yeah. yeah, but even then, yeah. you're still cycling, and all of your other yeah. cycle stuff, like the Flourishing Fox... Or the valley building rescuer. a deck, building a deck in best of one that has a good uh, a matchup against the cycling deck was very hard. Yeah, like because flourishing fox and the the rescuer pressure the ground so much, and then zenith flare just ends the game and like the mid game. Um, the cycling deck was problematic. I mm -hmm. like yeah. with sideboards. I think it would have been. Uh, very very powerful and format defining but not necessarily oppressive um but we we don't have any data to back that up because we haven't been able to run any paper tournaments since before ikoria came out yeah so huh. uh but wizard so made yeah. a decision and we got we should follow it 
I'm happy that Zenith Flare is gone. I yeah. think that yes. that <laughs> instead of cycling just hands down being the tier one deck, we now have a lot of space for multiple tier one decks. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, yes. R.I.P. Healers Hawk and Zenith Flare. <laughs> so, before, uh, speaking of which, tabletop. Um, you know, as soon as things open up, um, we will let everybody know. So keep uh, keep a lookout. Yeah, some of the local shops have been talking about um, figuring out plans of reopening tabletop play. I do believe that Watsi issued a no tournament policy for North America. I don't know if they lifted that yet, but we'll, this situation is evolving, and as it changes, we'll update everybody. But for now, there's no tournaments on the schedule whatsoever. Yeah. But right. that means that it's a great opportunity for you to play Magic Arena. Yeah? Yes. So if okay. any of the, our youth players out there want tips on how to play Magic Arena, you can play free-to-play. Mm-hmm. Um, or if you want to put a little bit of money in, you could probably get an Artisan deck real real quick. Yeah. Um, but if you are thinking about starting and you want tips uh, on you know how best to navigate the beginning of the game and building that collection... You know, shoot us a message, comment on the YouTube channel, or join join the Discord, and we'll, we're happy to help you. You know, I've heard that even more players are probably going to join in too, because they recently put it on another um, operating system, right? Yeah, yeah. Max. Yep. Uh, by the time this video is posted on YouTube, it will probably be live on Max. So. Yeah. If you guys are wondering how to do that, just make sure you get it through the Epic Game Store, but shouldn't be that hard to find it. Yeah, so we needed a mobile. mobile. Soon, yeah. Soon, they're saying they're working on it. I'm, I'm unsure, (laughs) but we'll see. All right, so I think that that covers housekeeping and announcements. Um, Yes. Let's move on to our top ten list. We have a sweet M twenty one set that just dropped on Arena, (laughs) and we're gonna be counting down our top ten. We also have um, Mr. Black. uh, Couldn't be here today, but. Yeah, Rob Black, uh, he's uh, the the Magic Club organizer over at Hanalani Schools. Shout out to Hanalani. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they've got a, a, a budding a budding club coming up there. Uh, but he submitted a top ten list, and will will be sharing his uh, his list as well. But uh, yeah, who wants let's, to start? Well, let's, let's start we with do honorable, honorable mentions. mentions. Well, what do you guys I, think I of the one... set though? Like, just set in okay, general. Okay, so, you think it's stronger? I'm, like, as strong as Akoria, just as strong, or...? I think that in terms of standard artisan, they are continuing the trend of printing very, very powerful uncommons, which yeah. I like. Yeah. Um. So I, I think standard artisan is going to be in a really good place. Just be, because we only got, got, like, very small glimpses of the format in paper before COVID hit, mm-hmm. um... And then, like, we've only had a couple of um, MTGA events. You know, I could be wrong about this, um, but it seems like Standard Artisan is similar to Standard in the sense that you kind of just want to be doing your powerful thing and aiming to not super interact with your opponent a lot of the time. But there's, at the same time, especially now with this set there's a lot of tools to interact as well. So Mm -hmm. if you want to interact, you can, but there's lots of different ways to just kind of um, play your super powerful solitaire game. Um, You know, there's all sorts of really powerful synergies that can go over the top of each other, which is very similar to the way that real standard is right now. So kind of how, like, we kind of saw Popper as, or I guess Popper standard as draft light, you can think of um, Artisan as standard light. Yeah, yeah. The the standard popper format was very much just about like nickel and diming your opponent. It was right. either you win on tempo or you win on card advantage. Yeah. And like those were the two dimensions of the format. And in this one it's like there's so many different um, axes that you can that you can try and fight on. Mm-hmm. Okay. Agreed. So yeah, let's just go to our honorable mentions then. You guys have right. any? I got mm-hmm. one. I really, really wanted to put this card on my top 10 list, but I could not justify it to myself because I don't think this is going to actually be a deck. I, I feel like um, we have it in the same honorable mention. <laughs> uh, so Teferi's Tutelage. 
is oh. um oh, darn uh, one <laughs> yeah one one blue two colorless enchantment can can you pull it up eric yeah yeah um one blue two colorless enchantment when it um enters the battlefield you can draw a card and then discard a card and then whenever you uh draw a card target you mill target opponent uh two cards so like it comes down you immediately draw and discard and then you're also immediately milling your opponent for two so this is like, like a really dirtily way to win mm -hmm. um it's just i don't i don't know if this is powerful enough to kind of compete with the other powerful things in the format so i might um, as well talk about this this is it's high it's lower on my list but this card gave me like really bad um, memories of Sphinx's tutelage when I started playing. But and... Sphinx's tutelage is way more powerful. Oh no, this. it's way more powerful. But in the sense that if it's gonna be artisan, I'm pretty sure you could just make some sort of dirtily um, turbo fog deck. Maybe not competitive, like hyper competitive, but something fun and interest. Well, I don't know if turbo fog is interesting, but to certain people, it's interesting. <laughs> It's interesting oh. for the person playing it. Yeah. I remember when I first got into Standard, when I got back into Standard, actually, um, I think Eric, I was playing, Eric and I were still playing, um, well, we're playing, and I remember making a blue-red deck based off of Sphinx Tutelage. <laughs> uh, Sphinx Tutelage and Fevered Visions. Yep. Yeah. Vision. <laughs> I love both of those cards. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I gotta say about like this card is also an honor, on, honorable mention. This is not on my list. I I'm like, <laughs> well, I want this card to work. I really yeah. do. Yeah, <laughs> I would. I would love to see somebody like come with a Teferi's Tutelage deck. If they can make it competitive, I will be super happy. I'm skeptical of it being able to compete though. Like Bro, there, there deck. isn't a whole there isn't a whole lot of support for it. You know how like the Tutelage deck. Well, first of all, like it milled a lot faster because yes. it, it, you got the tr the extra triggers, and second, it had the fevered visions to kind of like uh, go nuts with the the milling your making them draw as well as you draw extra cards, which then triggers it again. Um, so the, this deck is not going to have as fast of a clock, but it, you know if you can find a way to live for like ten plus turns. And, you know, by if you find your second tutelage and then you have the, both of them in play, then, you know, you only need maybe, like, three or four more turns. It, it, it can work. Whether Sean, it's competitive or not, Sean, we'll Sean, find Mike, out. you have little faith. I'll make it work. I'll turn it <laughs> into a boss deck and you guys will see. All right, I want you to record a video of you milling Mike out with Teferi's oh, tutelage. Okay, like yeah, no, deal. I'll do it. All so, right. Okay, also, so... Yeah. First, yeah. first new video, first new video of the new set, Eric dirtling with Teferi's tutelage. Yep, it's just gonna be a picture of just a um, play mat because the deck's gone. There's no deck, can't draw. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Okay, so that's my that's my one honorable mention. Okay, so um, sorry. Uh, for anyone does um, there's a new term that well, they're they're oh, actually yeah. using the word mill in this card so oh, yeah it's the keyword um, now yeah it's uh what what is the term evergreen is that what it's called no oh it's, no, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's an evergreen yeah. word so um yeah so when you hear those terms it mill means you just put x amount of cards on top of their li on from their library to your graveyard now there's actually a term like vigilance hexproof uh mm -hmm. mill is now a now a term so for those of you who are like like what is mill that's mill yeah, and all previous cards that say put the top card or top X cards from your deck to the library, that just means mill. Yeah. So we have a keyword now. Yep. All right, any other honorable mentions? I have one. I don't know if this all is right, on your list. It. I thought this was the enchantment you're talking about. I'm talking about five different enchantments. I think you know what I'm talking about. Oh, I oh am God. talking about the shrines. Yeah. Um, so the, whoa, where, why is there no shrine of, uh, you have an sanctum. S, you, you need to just type oh, shrine. We show sanctum. Yeah. So there's five different shrines. Um, the sanctum of tranquil light, it lets you tap a creature. Sanctum of calm waters, it lets you draw cards and discard one. 
um, Sanctum of Stone Fangs. Uh, it lets you gain life and your opponent loses life. Shattered Heights lets you discard a lander shrine and it deals X to a uh, creature planeswalker and Fruitful Harvest, which lets you add X mana um, into your mana pool during your pre combat main phase. So, how shrines work is all of them benefit from one another. So, if you have each of the shrines out, you'll be able to like either draw five or deal five or tap for only one mana or gain five mana. Lots of different benefits. But the problem is, the reason why I have it in my honorable mentions is because all of them are legendary. So if, yeah. you, uh, if you have an extra shrine and it's the same color, it's kind of just a dead card. So... But, but the blue shrine solves that problem, right? Yeah, no, it does. you discard your extra shrines. And if you, if you have all of the shrines out, you draw five cards, and then your opponent mills ten from um, Teferi's Tutelage, right? Right? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But um, there's, there's some cards that help you, like, get your mana to the right place because it's going to be a five-color deck. Um, and also, since it's an enchantment... We just got Theros, so there's lots of different Theros synergies we can use for the next year coming up. Yeah. So I don't have the shrines on my list, but when I was I was looking at them and thinking about them as I was putting my list together, I think if I built a shrine deck, I would just have it be the um, the Sultai constellation deck from Theros, yeah. and then just play like two of each of the Sultai shrines. I mean, if you really want to, there's we're going to talk about it later, but like I said, you can get lots of different colored mana um, with certain cards that ramp up. And you could just like put a couple colors in just for the Tranquil Light and um, Sacred Heights. But I, I don't really care about either of those effects. Like, well, no, I'm just saying one, in the general... The blue one are the only two that I actually want the effect from. The I'm other, just saying in general other... you can do that as an option. Fair, yeah. But I mean, the green one here fixes mana on its own. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we just stick in the red and the white for fun, right? Ah, <laughs> uh, if you want to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, I'm just. Fooling I would. Around I now. would play like, yeah. But I, I think that that Sultai Constellation deck from Theros was good, yes. and then you could just like throw in one or two of each of the Sultai shrines. Yeah. Because the black one is actually very good. No, that's that's a clock. The yeah. black one deals damage equal to the amount of shrines you have. And you gain life. Right? Yeah. So it buffers your life while giving them a clock. Right. So like Ilgotten Harrison's cost four for this effect, mm -hmm. and this one costs two. So like I would I would play this as a one of in like a black dirtly deck, just because I never if if I had a, like a mono black dirtly deck, I would play one of this. Because yeah. playing it on playing it for two mana is great, but then you never want to draw a second one. Mm -hmm. But then if you're playing the the green and the blue shrine as well, then you know, when you start doming them for two a turn, then... Yeah. And you draw three cards starts... a turn, and you get three mana. It's... Yeah. yeah, I mean, those those cards are really just there to make the Black Shrine better, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> the Black one is the one that you care about the most. No, nah, but win more. You gotta win more. I guess. No, but, yeah, I agree. Okay. Yeah, so Shrines, they'll be a lot of fun. I don't know how competitive they'll be, but... That's the challenge, the challenge is there. Exactly, yeah. exactly. A a any of you brewers out there, the the gauntlet has been thrown. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. So you got an honorable right. mention, Mike? Yeah, Basri Solidarity. I, lo I, I like that card. Uh, so uh, one white, one colorless for a sorcery. You put a one plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. Uh, it reminded me of uh. Pledge of Unity yep. from, I believe, War of the Spark. And um, I was a big fan. Well, I'm still a big fan of Green White uh, tokens. Uh, green, green White Proliferate, actually, is it. So, like, I really want this to work. And uh, I'm hoping to include include uh, Bastry Solidarity in the deck. But it's kind of hard because Pledge of Unity is actually really good. It's instant speed already. So, like... Uh, but yeah, that's my honorable mention. I, w I want that deck to work. I mean, as long <laughs> as you have lots of tokens, it's still a good card. I wouldn't mind having like a 
fifth or sixth of Pledge of Unity. Yeah. But then, yeah. like, it's, we it's haven't. Hard. It's hard because you have Pledge of Unity, and once you drop um, Quatley's Raptor, it's just another copy of Pledge of Unity minus the light game. I'm I'm gonna put a little uh, marker in this and come back to it later because I I have more to say about this when we get further down the list. Ooh, I like it's, that. This this card is not on my list, but I do want to talk about this card in conjunction with another card that is on my list. Ooh. Okay, yeah, I'm reading in mine. I know. It all right, all right. I like <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping it's not the same stock. I did not see your list. So I'm not trying to copy you. <laughs> no, I think I we think... all I think we all have it. Let's, yeah, let's I think be honest. there's going to be a fair amount of overlap. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, are we on to 10? Do you want yep. me to go first? Do it. Uh, yeah. Okay. So my 10, this is an, This was almost an honorable mention, but I put it on the list because just this card used to be amazing, and I have no idea if it's going to find a home uh, in this format. But uh, Query and Dryad is my 10th card. Oh my so it's, gosh. Um, this oh. is a reprint. Sorry. It used to be a rare. Um, but it's one green, one colorless for a 1-1 one, one Dryad. And then whenever you cast a spell that's white, blue, black, or red, put a plus one, plus one counter on Query and Dryad. So, like, if you if you play this in a deck that is, like, only a little bit green, and then you have a bunch of other non-green spells, um, then it can grow really, really quickly. Um, the problem is that, like, usually in older formats, when this card was good... Uh, you had really, really good mana. So you could play, like, you know, your Dryad on two and then still have whatever mana you need to, like, cast whatever other cheap spells that you're going to play. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if the mana is going to be there to make this work, but this card has been very good in previous formats. It used to be a rare. I feel like it might be worth trying to build around. Yeah, man, I I'm a, love and I'm a little more optimistic about this coming together than Teferi's Tutelage. So that's why it's my number 10. <laughs> mm -hmm. Dude, I love Miracle Grow. It is yeah, that was so a, it was a very good deck. But yeah. again, I think the key to that deck was the, the dual lands. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, playing your Quirion Dryad and then trying to play a bunch of... Playing enough green sources to play your Quirion Dryad on turn two, but then like you don't want to have a whole bunch of other mono green cards in your deck. Yeah. Uh, and then it just gets really awkward. But, mm -hmm. you know, like, Opt is in the format, Defiant Strike is in the format, Crash Through is in the format. Yeah, there's lots um, of good cards that kind of work with that attack yeah. with one creature and protect it. Yeah, so, well, I, I don't know if this will find a home, but I'm I'm hopeful that it will. Yeah, I love it. It's such a nice card. Yeah, so that's my 10. What's your 10, Eric? Uh... The fairy's tutelage. No, I like the card. Okay. I just like it a yeah. lot. Yeah. All right, we're 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 feeling similar about uh, it. So, honestly, I had another card for number ten, but my friend just said while he was playing arena, "Oh man, I hate the fairy's tutelage." And then I just all of the flashbacks came back, and I said, "Man, <laughs> if you only knew how bad it was." So. I was like, mm, I could probably try and make a fun Artisan Brew deck out of this, like, for that series that I make. So, you know, and I think that there's, like, a good amount of protection if you think of cards like uh, Improbable Alliance. So you could try and make a yeah. draw two deck and then um, use the fairies to just protect yourself. So... There's there's always that option. But, yeah. Yeah, there's also some amount of fog deck, so if you really want to go the turbo fog route, then there's that. Uh one other thing. Uh I don't know, I don't know if this is on your list. It's a common, so we did get somewhat of a reprint through frantic inventory. So uh. you draw a card and then you draw cards equal to the number of frantic inventories in your graveyard. So, you could... I miss playing Magic when cards like this were good. <laughs> yeah. What was the card called? Accumulate Knowledge? Yeah, yeah. Accumulated Knowledge. Yeah, so... And, and Take Inventory was the one that was this, but Sorcery speed. Yeah. So you could just use stuff like this, or like the Jumpstart cards that are in um, Ravnica, Guilds of Ravnica. You could just use those, yeah. and 
just draw over and over and then fuel up your draw twos along with the fairy's tutelage. So there's always that option too. Make it work, Eric. I yep. wanna I wanna oh. see at least three different videos of three different Sphinxes or um Teferi's Tutelage decks. Man, I only named two. I don't know if I can do a third one. <laughs> I believe in you. <laughs> Alright, so that's Eric's ten, Mike. Oh, this is my ten. Uh Fran uh frantic inventory is actually my ten. Oh, well, we can talk more about it. Yeah, so I was thinking of improv of uh, the is it draw two? Um yeah, Just I like that. this way more than radical idea. Yeah, what's? Uh, yeah, they're really they're comp like when uh, Eric was explaining. I was just thinking how this comp is a uh, a radical idea needs to compete with this card. But I don't know. I feel like radical idea just has a slight edge because like we draw. Oh no. Well, specifically uh, in the draw two um deck, it has an edge just because you can use that ability twice. But this draws generally yeah, more cards. That's true. Yeah, Radical Idea isn't card advantage. This eventually becomes card advantage. Yeah. I think, it, like, because it's 10, it's 10 because just be, well, Narsa is still running around in the format. Um, It just makes this card a bit harder to, uh, a bit harder to play. Yeah. Narsa is very good against the draw 2 deck. But there's another card on my list that answers that. But we'll get to that later. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's my that's my ten. Trying to take the inventory. All right, so we're on to my nine. Yes. All right. Well, Mike, I'm glad that your ten was a common because my nine is a common. Ooh, I, like I, that. I thought I I thought I was gonna be the only one with a common on my list. So spined megalodon. Can can you pull it up, Eric? Yep. Ooh, that's a hex I mean, that's a hexproof creature. Yeah, it's the blue blue five. I think it's like a 5-7 hexproof shark. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and whenever it attacks, you scry one. So we haven't had like a good hexproof creature in Artisan that has a big butt um, yeah. since uh, Dominaria rotated out. Yeah. But like uh, the, the Dirtle Turtle, what was it called? The Spine um, something. Snapper. Something Snapper. Cold Water Snapper. Right. Cold Water yep. Snapper. There yep. we go. And then the, the Sidewinder Serpent. Uh, that was in uh, Hour of Devastation before that. Like, any time that you have, like, a, oh, a big hexproof creature, especially one that has high toughness, um, like, it's going to be a very, very powerful finisher, whether it's in control decks or now that there's a bunch of new tools from this set, I think this might actually make for a, a very good top end for, like, a blue-green ramp deck. Mm -hmm. So, um... Before well, there was Compongulus... Yeah, but yeah, you know, humongous is he's cute. It's not, he's not very humongous. Yeah, he's a cutie. That's that's what yeah. I have to say. This this guy is um, he, he's a big boy. Yeah, and scrying one every time you attack um, that is you know, extra. Yeah, it's nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kill someone in four hits. If they this guy blocks block, almost everything, <laughs> so I wouldn't mind to add in one more mana to get this thing flying. Jeez! <laughs> but then it couldn't be a shark. <laughs> we had, dude, we had flying sharks in the last set. That was <laughs> only because of they they were in the tornado, right? That, this yeah. one's not in a tornado. Well, the tornado I mean, I, doesn't last forever. I, I believe I it mean, has wings, invisible wings. Okay. I would love. Yeah. All right. Carry on. Okay. All right. So that's my nine. I am, you know, control top end, ramp top end. Is a big boy. Yep. And a common at that. Really yeah. good. Can't wait to draft this card. Yeah. Okay, so... Some people, they like to call me the dirtily train conductor. Because I love me some engines. So, the card that I picked is Witch's Cauldron. Oh, I wanted to put this card on my list, but I didn't. So, but yeah, go ahead. Um, one deck that I built for one of our students is a green black attrition deck. I think it got third place in one of the um, scholarship yeah, the tournaments. December scholarship tournament. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, yeah. basically, how it basically how it works is it uses a card called Spark Reaper. 
Spark Reaper, which lets you sacrifice a creature Planeswalker for 3 to gain a life and draw a card. And Sanitarium Skeleton. Oh, Sant. Sanitarium Skeleton. Which lets you return it from your grave to the hand. So you just make a constant loop of drawing a card each turn while putting the skeleton to your hand. But what makes Witch's Cauldron so great is that... Blah, blah, blah. Maybe it's just I like witches because Witching Wolf was there, but... What, I, what makes it so great is it's not a creature anymore, it's cheaper and um, it's cheaper to cast and it's cheaper to activate. So just being able to do all of that makes it such a better card. Like we only have Sanitarium Skeleton for three more months, but I'm going to try and find a way for it to work. I, I love me some dirtily decks. I don't think that Artisan is... Like, cause that that green black deck that you're talking about was yes. a standard popper where, popper where card deck. advantage card advantage matters a lot. Yeah. Whereas in this format, it still matters, but it's not as important as mm -hmm. in that other format. True. And so that's the reason I didn't put it on my list. Like, basically, I think the only deck that would think about running this, the only esta currently established deck that would run this, is the red black sack deck. Mm -hmm. And I think weaponize the monsters is just a better card yeah. for that slot. I also think, it's, yeah. Because it's repeatable, like you can do it multiple times a turn, and that deck just wants to end the game. It doesn't want to draw the game out. Mm -hmm. Well, you remember so. when you when you first started Artisan, you wanted to make a Sir Conrad deck? I think it could work in this. Okay, yeah. I, I do agree that there's a lot of potential in this card. Yeah. And that's what the 10 and 9 are all about, right? Yeah. But yeah. Witch's Cauldron. What right. you got, Mike, for number nine? Mike, what's your nine? It's actually between two cards. They're two green cards. I was at, one of which is Query and Dryad. That was actually a nine. Okay. Um, because this card is just splashable, and what if, like any green, any green X deck. Um, and I did not actually. I did not know it was a rare, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it used to be a rare. Mm -hmm. I, I think Plane Shift. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. I guess. So, there is that, and the other card is a common is Lanowar Visionary. So this card, two colorless, one green for a two-two. When it enters the battlefield, draw a card, and you tap to add mana. So essentially, it's a, it's the, it's the child of Lanowar Visionary and Lanowar Elf. Mm -hmm. Oh, or, you know, no, you know what my first thought right? was. My my first thought after this uh this card was previewed was, man, I wish we were still playing standard popper. <laughs> yeah, because this this it's card a... would just be a king in standard popper. <laughs> it would probably be number one, honestly. Yeah. So I mean, Elvish Visionary. Sorry, Elv well, yeah. Um, I don't know. For I when I saw it, I was like, oh, I like. I really like this card too, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's and it's something to. I think it's a better slot in from. Uh, I think before I, like I think JP's mono green deck had a uh, leaf can druid, but we can. Re but, uh, but this is good. It replaces itself and it helps ramp. So, yeah, mm -hmm. this and uh, Query and Dryad are like my tie for nine. So like I like Elvish Visionary because it lets me draw a card, and I like. Land of War Elves because it makes mana, but I just feel like doing it for three mana feels like too much. That's the thing. Yeah, Cause... I agree that this is awkward on on the curve of most uh, most ag aggressive decks. Yeah, I'd want my dorks on one or two. Three, I kind of feel like I want to do stuff. Like two, you still have that one of uh, one creature from Euphoria, Humble Natural. Is it Humble Naturalist? Well, you have Humble Naturalist, but you also have the. Dryad in Theros, which lets you tap for any color, and you can, if you have a power creature two or, or four or more, it taps for yeah. two mana. And Paradise Druid. Paradise, oh, yeah, Druid, Paradise Druid. Druid. Yeah. So, yeah, I think because Paradise Druid, yeah, Paradise Druid is still in a format, um, you know, that's what makes it a uh, nine. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I like this card. 
Yeah, I really like it too. I look forward to casting it a lot in draft. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so we're up to eight. Yep. Alright, my eight should be no surprise to anyone. Um, Shipwreck Dowser is a... Uh, is the Ooh. next form of my old my old flame salvager of secrets yep so it's a two blue three colorless for a three three uh merfolk wizard it has prowess which means whenever you cast a non-creature spell it gets plus one plus one and then also uh when it enters the battlefield return target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand so i have two questions for you sean how much yes. does salvager of secret cost five, five. The same amount? How big was it? Yeah, it was a 2-2. So this is just a strict upgrade. Yeah, but and it has Salvager powers. of Secrets was a common. Yeah. And do we have Soul Salvage in Standard right we, now? We have many variations of Soul Salvage yeah. in Standard right now. I like one for Bones, there's Dread Revels, there's the new one that costs one if you gain three life this turn. So like... I, I think that the only issue is like that the old blue-black deck from from Popper relied a lot on like Dusk Legion Zealot and um, mm. like the the one mana one one death touch dudes mm -hmm. uh, which were very good in that format to like have enough creatures to make soul salvage loops like beneficial uh, I don't know what you're gonna like fill this deck with um, like right. Cloudkin Seer might like it, it might just be a little too underpowered mm -hmm. um, compared to what you're for... doing now in for artisan. artisan yeah because yeah. scholar of ages did exist and i had a sweet blue black scholar of ages dirtily deck but it just seemed underpowered compared to other stuff so maybe maybe this will be different mm -hmm. maybe it won't we'll see but um i want this card to be good i like making soul salvage loops and just never running out of stuff to do <laughs> yeah. the problem with artisan is that everything is so powerful that you know, you usually die with a bunch of stuff to do in your hand. Yeah. So, we'll I see. But, yeah. All right, you... Okay, so... So that was my eight. I think we can agree that there are probably two really good black kill spells, right? Would you guys agree to that? Yes. Yeah. So there's... It's... I'm going to just say, number eight is one of those two. The first is an uncommon called Eliminate, which destroys a target creature or planeswalker with CMC 3 or less. And the second one is a common called Grasp of Darkness, which, oh, which gives only a creature minus 4, minus 4, so it doesn't kill a planeswalker. Both of them are instant, one is harder to cast than the other, so there. But I decided to actually make my number eight grasp of darkness over eliminate and i think i just have a couple reasons for that the first is uh even though it costs double black i think it's a bit more versatile because even though it can't kill planeswalkers we only have planeswalkers for the next three months so that's not going to apply and eliminate just feels a bit more narrow so even though this gives a creature minus four minus four i think It'd be more worth it than, like, let's say there's a four mana creature, but you have eliminate. You can't really kill it. But if you're able to kill it with Grasp of Darkness, then it's more relevant than the eliminate. So that's pretty much why I chose it. Yeah, I agree with all those things. I didn't. I don't have eliminate on my list at all. Yeah. Basically, like. I don't have spoiler warnings. I don't have any of the removal spells on my list at all. And the reason for it is because like I was just looking over all of them and it's like Faith Sweaters is great, Eliminate is great, Grasp of Darkness is great, blah blah mm -hmm. blah. It goes on and on. But they all are like pretty interchangeable. It's like, oh, this is a slight upgrade over this other option that we have. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so we're basically just choosing our ninth and tenth pick basically for a kill spell in our deck. Yeah. Like I'm sure that this card will see play, but I think that just by the nature of the of the artisan format, like you're trying to put together doing something broken mm -hmm. in most of your decks. Yeah. And like the decks that are trying to control the game and break apart people's broken stuff, like the tools to do all that is are already there. Mm -hmm. Right? Like Grasp of Darkness isn't gonna make a new you know, make 
control decks competitive again. Yeah. Like they're already competitive. They already have the tools. This is probably going to go into it. Yeah. But that was just I, my my reasoning for why I don't have any of the, the yeah. removal spells. But for oh the goodness. kill, for all of the removal spells, this one is the one that I picked out of all of them. Yeah, I agree with everything that you said about it. I like Narset is a pain in the in the butt the for a bunch of decks, but again, that's like the, the next three months, and yeah. it's only a couple decks run Narset. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. My thoughts on this is hard because I, I rather like for me. I like uh, Omnisilus Cruelty. One more mana for an extra minus one, minus one, and you get the Exile effect. Um, that's just that's just my thoughts on it. Oh yeah, that's um, true too. You wouldn't wanna you wouldn't wanna deal with that threat. Like you just hit him once and that's it. Mhm. Mm but so, yeah, but of all of the of all of the removal in this, I just chose Grasp of Darkness. Yeah. Cool. Like, all right. So, so that was Eric's 8. Mike, what's your 8? Tormod's Crypt. <laughs> I love it. Tormod's Crypt. Even though Zenith Flare is gone now? Well, see, this, I made the list prior to... um, prior, I didn't I didn't know Zenith Flare was banned until today, so you guys said something. So I oh, just, okay. So Tormod's Crypt, 0 mana for uh, Artifact, Tap, Sacrifice it, Exile all cards from Target Player's Graveyard. Um, I mean, yes, it does hit the Zenith Flare deck. Um, that's why when, when you mentioned that it's it was banned, like, oh, in best of three, I don't think it would be an issue because you just you just pay zero and you just um, you can activate once they cast uh, Zenith Flare. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, like, I think it does hit a lot of other decks. So like that, this probably would hit um, decks that run on Escape. Mm -hmm. um, it, it yeah. does it just, uh, shoot on the... The any Undergrowth deck is actually very good in Artisan. Yeah, the Undergrowth deck gets, mm -hmm. will get hit. Uh, any any uh, graveyard-based deck would just probably just get hit every time. So, like, Sean Salvager loop will get hit. Yeah. <laughs> and you're not really paying much for... There's not much of a opportunity... Or, what am I saying? There's not much of a cost for Tormod's Crypt anyway, because it's zero mana. Yeah. Um. So. Um. And I'm looking long, like in the long term, long term as well. So this is just a great addition. I, like, I feel like it's better than Soul, Soul, uh, Soul Guide Lantern. Mhm. Mm um, mm. I mean, you still get a card off of a uh, Soul, Soul Guide Lantern, but I don't know. Yeah, this one's faster. Yeah. So, well, yeah. it's with Soul Guide Lantern. It's either you get their entire graveyard or you get your card back. So, like, since we're playing best of three, you're only gonna side this in when you want to nuke their whole graveyard. So, I, in that sense, I like it more than Soul Guide Lantern. Mm -hmm. If we were playing best of one, I think Soul Guide Lantern would be oh yeah, yeah would be yeah. much better. Okay, cool. Tormod Scripts. So that was your eight. Yes. Yeah. All right, so my seven. We're getting into the juicy ones now. Mm -hmm. My seven is Obsessive Stitcher. Ooh. It is one black, one blue, one colorless. I think it's a two three. No, no, it's zero, a zero three. three. Yeah. Um, but it's a human wizard, and you can either tap it to draw a card and then discard a card, or you can pay two blue or excuse me, one blue, one black, two colorless. Tap it, sack it to reanimate something from your graveyard. <laughs> you know, I love uh, this card. A creature. Yeah, so like we've seen various different um, reanimate payoffs, right? Like your nefarious dragon mage uh, combo, yep. and my Godzilla this, deck, and yeah, the the Titanoth Rex. Like, there's a lot of good payoffs for the reanimate strategy. So I think that having a three drop that is both your enabler and your, um, you know, like you you have to loot, um, you know, in the an enabler in the sense that it loots and puts the reanimate target in your graveyard, mm -hmm. and then your payoff in the sense that it um, then reanimates the thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think having that stapled together in one card is very good for those reanimate decks. Yeah, and also um, being able to like activate the second ability at the end of your opponent's turn, so mm. the creature doesn't quite have haste, but it sort of has haste. Yeah. Um, 
I, I just think that this is a, a powerful addition to that specific archetype. There's probably going to be a bunch of different ways to build that archetype, um, but I, I think that this is going to be an auto-include anytime you're trying to reanimate stuff. Yeah, so since I've played this deck a lot, I've noticed that the hardest part is actually trying to find the cards. So what I would use is like Meyer Triton or something just to mill, but that only does it one time. I'd also use uh, Tomb Tombbound Lich, which kind of does the same yeah. ability as Stitcher. But it was really the hardest part was trying to draw cards so I could get the reanimate spell. And it's even worse if it goes into the grave because then it's worthless. And trying to re yeah, and I'm trying to reanimate it, like putting it in the grave and reanimating it, and this right. just does so both. This, yeah, this does everything. Mm -hmm. So the, this is a very powerful card. Yeah. I I imagine that the reanimate decks will be significantly better after this is um, yep. this is legal. You you'll bet you'll bet that I'm gonna do it. Yes. That's your third deck. That should be your third deck error. Do I just need to put one Sphinx's tutelage in the deck so it works? Is that what no, you're saying? You, you don't need to put a tutelage in that deck. Just, <laughs> just reanimate and kill your opponent with 11 11s. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So that was that was my seven. Mm hmm. So, uh, my number seven is also a gold card. Um, you guys are going to think it's a meme pick or a weird pick, but hear me out. Just hear me out. So there was a card called Legion Conquistador, right? Mike, you really like Legion Conquistador, right? Oh, that's automatic right there. Yeah. It was very good in Popper. What you basically when the card advantage mattered a lot. What you basically did was put all of the Legion Conquistadors from your deck into your hand. So you have four or three extra creatures. So this is kind of a shout out to one of my friends. He really likes this um tribe so my number um it's actually a pair of three if you guys know what i'm getting at um yeah. it is alpine houndmaster so it is a boros card so one in a white it is a human warrior and when he enters the battlefield you can search for a card named alpine watchdog and or a card named igneous Kerr. you reveal them put them in your hand and shuffle your library now, we'll look at his other ability later, but let's look at the other cards. Um, Alpine, oh. Alpine. So Alpine Watchdog is a 2-2 two, two for 2 mana with Vigilance. Nothing special. And Igneous... It's a dog. Come on, it's special. Well, this one's on fire. Yeah. And Igneous Kerr Cur is a 1-2 two for 2 mana, and it has... Uh, fire breathing so you can pay one in a red to give it plus two plus zero to the end of turn um, What I think is better about this card than um, Legion Conquistador is You're not only getting two twos Well Legion Conquistador costs three mana so it costs one each of these costs one less But you're not only getting two twos, but you're getting two twos with abilities So you're basically getting or it's a one two, but you're getting a 1-2 that can get stronger, and you're getting a 2-2 two -two with Vigilance. Not only that, this isn't really a one-and-go, or one-shot, where with Legion Conquistador, you can only search for the three Legion Conquistadors and you're done. You're actually search. you can act potentially, as long as you get the Alpine Howlmaster, search for, I think, 16 cards? No. What? 12 cards. You can... Or, Eight, eight cards. You can eight search cards. for eight if you, cards. If you draw four, if you draw yeah. four hound masters, then you draw eight extra cards. So you can search for eight cards, and all of those are relevant bodies. But what makes this even better is it's perfect for a Boros deck because Alpine Master doesn't only search for it. So whenever he attacks, he gets plus z x plus zero, where x is the number of other attacking creatures. So in like a hyper aggressive Boros deck. You can just get him really big and maybe try and find some form of evasion. So you just swing in for the win. So yeah. I agree with what you said about like this guy having a, a good body and like being a good he's just at home in an aggressive deck. I would one hundred thousand percent play him if 
I could just guaranteed to never draw the cards that he searches for unless mm -hmm. I'm searching for them. Because I I like I never want to draw a two mana two two vigilance in this format. Yeah. I never want to draw a two mana one two with fire breathing in this format. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I don't think that those cards are good enough in an in a in an aggressive deck without this guy. Mm -hmm. So like if I'm for free searching them up every time, that's awesome. Like it's just free on a creature that is already pretty decent. Like even if he never didn't search for them. His, his stats and ability make him playable, mm -hmm. right? But filling your deck up with these other cards that I don't really want to draw, that's that makes me a little hesitant. Yeah. But In a maybe... way, you could kind of think of this like a companion, where um, you're sort of playing at a uh, handicap, but you get a small amount of value out of it. Yeah. I, I just wish that like one of the things that he searches up was a one drop so that you could like play him mm. on two and then just play two crappy creatures on turn three every time. Like that would be very good. Yeah. But But you get to search I'm, up. Dogs. I'm not super excited about casting either of those uh, other cards. It's all I mean, about the value. Well, yeah, I mean for it, I mean if it cop if it'd be cool if it copied if it could find more copies of itself. Mm. <laughs> well that that would be crazy. That's just getting absurd. Uh, okay. All right, so, Eric, that was your seven? Yes, that was my seven. All right, Mike, what's your seven? Uh, my seven is between um, Ranger's Guile and uh, Feet of... Uh, feet of... Uh, Resistance. Yeah. So... Um, so what these two cards, Ranger's Guile is one green for an instant target creature gets, you control gets plus one plus one and gains hex proof in the turn. And Feet of Resistance is, uh, one white, one colorless for an instant, but a one, one counter on target creature you control gains protection from the color of your choice. Of those. Uh, I put those two together because essentially it's like, uh, you can technically say they're both give hex proof, it's just that one's like, well, um, you can tutor Hexproof with Feet of Resistance. Um, I know back then we had, um, during Kaladesh, we had Blossoming Defense, and Eric loved himself, so, uh, yeah. Blossoming Defense. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what what the um, Boggles deck needs in, uh, in Artisan. Well, the so-called Boggles deck. <laughs> Dude, I'll tell you what. Feet of Resistance doesn't only give Hexproof. It gives Unblockable, it too, if you think of it that way. Yeah. As as long as your auras are not the same color as their creatures. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's a, I think it's a nice it's a nice replacement because healer healer's hawk is no is no longer allowed. Yeah, I I so, think in any strategy that is just trying to protect like one big super important creature, both of these cards will be fine. Includes like query and triad. Yes. It, mm -hmm. But if you are playing Query and Dryad, you'd rather play Feet of Resistance because then you would get an extra trigger off of your Query and Dryad. It'd be a 3-3. Three, three. So, um, yeah. I just, I just think about like the Boggles decks because I do, I used to play, I used to play Boggles, Popper, mm -hmm. hashtag pile of cards. <laughs> Yeah, well, there are a bunch of one mono one one life linkers out there now, so yep. you can pile all the R's you want on them. <laughs> like that. Just unfortunately, the best one is now banned. Yeah. 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 But it's okay. okay. So, Mike, that was your seven. Yes. All right. So, Eric, for my um, for my six, you can just go ahead and type into that search bar "gain three life." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Oh, well, let me just... So, there's Sorry. there's three cards in particular that I think are going to be good enough to, like, make this an archetype, but the one that I'm going to officially say is my number six is um, the Silver Smite Ghoul. And the only reason that this one, I think, is getting a little edge over the other two, because um, the Airy and the Patrician are, um, are both probably powerful enough that 
these three cards will be kind of the crux of um of a decent archetype. Um, the the ghoul might see play in red black sack as well because if you are playing witches of him, um, mm. can sack a food to gain three life and then bring this guy back. Mm-hmm. Um, so he gets the nod over the other two as the best one because it might go into more archetypes. But these three cards themselves will probably make their own archetype. Um, yeah, so Silver Smoke Ghoul, three mana, one black, two colors for a 3-1 zombie vampire. At the beginning of your end step, if you gain three or more life this turn, return it from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped, and then you can play a pay a black and a colorless to sack it and draw a card. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of value. It's a decent body. Comes into play tapped, so it's a little bit awkward on board presence. Um, but if your whole deck is designed to be gaining three life regularly, um, it's a lot of value. Yeah. Um, the Airy is a two mana enchantment, one white, one colorless. Um, and then it just says at the beginning of your end step, if you gain three or more life this turn, create a two two white griffin creature token with flying. So, you know, a two two flying creature every turn, as long as you're meeting the thing, doing the thing that your deck is designed to do. Very powerful payoff. And then the last one is a um, the indulging patrician is one black, one white, one colorless for a one four vampire noble with flying and lifelink. And then if you gain three or more life at the end of your turn, uh, each opponent then loses three life. So between these three cards, I feel like you have an archetype on your hands. Obviously, Revitalize got reprinted, so it goes it slots right in. There's tons of other ways to gain life. Um, Witch's Oven, you know, obviously goes well with all of these. Any food maker. So I think, I think this will go more in like the black-white sacrifice deck. Um, because you have Cruel Celebrant for a bit, uh, you still have that, um, one enchantment that whenever you, whenever you sac, whenever a creature dies, you you just drain them out. Bastion so, of Remembrance? I think that's the one. Yeah. Um, I'll tell yeah. you, so I'll tell you what. You, um, you could probably overlap those two decks a fair amount. I'll tell you guys I, what. I do oh. think that there is going to be a, a dedicated... I'm building my deck to just gain three life each turn as often as I can mm-hmm. deck because these payoffs are powerful enough to grind people out. Yeah. So I actually, I think it was the soul brothers deck. It was the black, white, um, lifelink deck. I'm pretty sure yeah. you could just slot all of those cards into this too. And you would get that value. So there's already a home for it, but doing the three, Making a gain three life a turn deck isn't that hard anyway. Right. Yeah, so I I think that these these three will be in the same decks together a lot. I also think that the ghoul will see a little bit more play without the other two. Um, But yeah, maybe the Aerie will see play without the other two as well, just in that Soul Brothers deck. Yeah, I mean, you can just... This can be the new cauldron familiar that's, combo. That's the new cat combo. Yeah, it just costs three mana each turn. Yeah. Yeah, there's but tons it. of potential for it. Yeah, so okay. that was my that was my six. Yep. Okay, so number six. Um, it's actually a reprint. It is kite sail, kite sail freebooter. So, for one and a black, you get a 1-2 flying human pirate. And whenever he enters the battlefield, you reveal, or your opponent reveals a hand, and you choose a creature, or non-creature, non-land card from it. And it stays exiled under Freebooter until it leaves the battlefield. So, the way I, I mean, obviously this is a good card, it's seen standard play. But, the way I see it is trying to combine a duress with a stormcrow so stormcrow was a one in a blue one two flyer so basically this without um the ability and duress is the ability without the creature and duress costs one mana stormcrow costs two mana so the way i think about it is you are bundling up um a creature and a spell for two mana instead of three mana total so you're saving one mana and that alone just shows how powerful the card is and 
even if you kill it, like so, unlike the rest where it goes into the graveyard, if you kill, if the opponent kills Kite Sail Freebooter, they get the hand or they get the card back. But even then, you still benefit from it because you get to see what's in your opponent's hand. So you have information, and information is still really good to have. Yeah, this card is at its best when it's um, in a deck with a bunch of aggressive creatures because you want to ideally kill them before you know um, before they get the card back, or you want to punish them on tempo, right? Because mm -hmm. if you if you look at their hand and you take the most important card, and then they have to spend their next turn like using a removal spell on this, then they fall a little bit behind on tempo. Yep. Or you could do it the other way around and take the removal spell and then that they were using to slow you down, and then you just kill them before their most important card matters, right? Yeah. Um, so, like, this card very rarely is going to keep a card under it for the whole game, mm -hmm. um, but it does just enough that it's that's the reason why it sees play in those decks. My only concern about that is that I don't know if there is a mono black aggro deck or just a, a black aggro deck that's oh, going to do that no dude don't worry my number two will show you the way okay <laughs> yeah he th this guy didn't make my list but uh i acknowledge that it's powerful mm -hmm. i i think in in standard whereas like a very good mono black deck that it's already going to slot into i i think this guy is gonna be great there yeah he, uh, the only reason he's not on my list is i'm not sure if it has the supporting cast in this format yeah but i could be wrong mm -hmm. all right so that was eric six mike what's your six my six was the uh, um was the re was actually the removal spells so eliminate uh finishing blow and grasp of darkness okay so i kind of bundled those together just be um uh, eliminate and finishing blow. Just well, if if there if I had to prioritize them, I would put eliminate higher on the list. Just because, right? We're still in a format where we still have uncommon planeswalkers, and the um, Quatli, Sahili, and Narset are still being played. Um, kind of. Like eliminate. each of those only go into one deck, really. Yeah. They also cost uh, three mana. So that's why, like, uh, um, I was looking at. I mean, eliminate, like, let's just say the Hotly is in the big butt deck. You can just easily take all the creatures. Yeah. Um, but um, I don't know. I just feel like with with those decks running around, there's not. It's it's pretty hard to answer like Sahili just because like the thought that produces just protects it protects itself. Narset, um. Like you're just probably gonna you're probably gonna find your removal spell to protect itself. So um that was just my thing with eliminate. Um I do like finishing blow. Um four colorless one black instant destroy target creature or artifact. Um oh I'm sorry, creature or planeswalker. Um again it goes back to my reason because we we do have planeswalkers in the format. Although we do have them for like not, we don't have that much time left with them. But while they're still there, you know, might as well make use of the resources that do, that do answer things walkers. So my concern about finishing blow is just that it costs five, right? Like, so much of this format is going to be creatures that cost like two and three, and mm -hmm. anytime that you're spending five mana to kill something that costs two or three, like you're just gonna be losing. So that's that's my only concern about finishing blow. The f the flexibility is is an upside. And sometimes your opponent might be like playing a big, huge creature that costs like five or six mana, but in this format, like that's pretty rare. Yeah, I mean planeswalker wise too. All of the planeswalkers that are played are like three mana too, so the finishing blow doesn't really apply to that. Yeah. The art is really nice though. I would have that up on a wall. Is that Obnixilis getting killed? No, it's just a demon. Oh, okay. But, like, just how it's drawn, it's... or painted. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, so that was... that was Mike's six. Okay, my, my five is a pair of cards. Okay. Mostly, um... I think that ramp strategies are gonna be getting oh. a big buff in Hold this. Um, I got your... I got one of them. 
no, 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 no. That that's that's going to be later in the list. So, oh, okay. but these these next two cards like are going to be a payoff for green red ramp. Um, so volcanic geyser and leafkin avenger. I think. Yep. Uh, basically, the problem with with ramp decks, um, we see ramp being like the most powerful thing to do in standard, but that's because all the rares and mythics are busted when you play them early. But you, we don't have as many like super high power level um, uncommons. Like most of the the strong uncommons that we're seeing are like synergy based instead of just sheer power level. Mm -hmm. um, but if you did want to play a ramp deck, you need like sheer power level at the top to catch you back up. And so volcanic geyser just allows you to like point it at your opponent's head and be like you're dead. Um, and then Leafkin Avenger is like a ramp card that can bridge you to your late game and is also a payoff in and of itself. Yeah. So like the the ramp, the whole, the pitfall of a pure ramp deck is that you want to play your ramp spells and then your payoff spells. And if you draw only one of those and not the other, then you're screwed. Mm -hmm. um, so Leafkin Avenger is kind of both in one package, right? It'll ramp you, and then if you don't have any um, payoff cards, uh, you can use this activated ability as a payoff. Mm -hmm. So Leafkin Avenger, um, one green, one red, two colorless for a 4-3 elemental druid. Tap it to add green for each creature um, with power 4 or greater you control, and then you can pay, is it 7 in a red? 7 in a red. 7 in a red, so 8 mana total, and it deals damage equal to its power to target player or planeswalker. So you, you can just start nugging your opponent. Mm -hmm. um, and then Volcanic Geyser is just red, red, X, instant, deal X damage to any target. So, like, once you um, cast all your ramp spells, spoiler warnings, there's <laughs> a good one in this set. Yeah. Um, once you cast all your ramp spells, you just have this big payoff thing. You, you know, you can kill a creature, you can kill a planeswalker, you can kill your opponent, whatever. Yeah, the good thing about Volcanic Geyser is ju just that it's so um, modal. So if you're about to die or you see a big threat, you don't have to use it as a win condition. You can just use it to kill that big threat, especially yeah. since it's any target. Like if they play Huatli, if it's a big butt, or if they play um, Sahili, you can just, you know, get rid of that quick. Well, they have big toughness, but you know what I mean. Yeah. In a pinch. So like... I don't know if the ramp deck is going to want to be green-red. If it is, then I think these are appealing. Blue-green is also appealing just because Growth Spiral is so insane. Um, mm. But, uh, yeah, I, I think that these are worth looking at. Well, Sean, I'll we'll like get back to this card later. I'll talk to you about it. Okay, like sweet. This is, higher, this is higher up on my list. Nice, I like nice. The yeah, with the warden and Grumgully. Ooh, I like a whole rule becomes a thing. Please, JP, yeah. if you're listening, please make rule a thing. <laughs> All right, so that was my five. Going to my five. My five is a card that's probably on everybody's list. It is Winding Constrictor. I mean, Conclave Mentor. So, <laughs> Conclave Mentor is a green and a white for a two-two Centaur Cleric. Pretty cool guy. Um, when he, whenever you would get a plus one plus one counter from anything, and it would be put on a creature that you control, you can put that many plus one. So we've seen effects like this, such as um, Winding Constrictor in Amonkhet, or what was the enchantment? Winding Constrictor was um, no, it was, was on Kaladesh. Oh yeah, Kaladesh. sorry, sorry, they they just meld together. But Winding <laughs> Constrictor, Constrictor in Kaladesh, and Hardened Scales in Cons. Yeah. We get both of those abilities. Um, it's not as good as Hardened Scales just because it's a creature, but that's that's not too bad because its second ability, when he dies, you gain life equals to its power. That's that's just all extra. You it helps you survive the late or it helps you survive aggro. It makes your creatures bigger. Well, this um, thing is just like a lightning rod, right? Like, yeah. You play this, and your opponent is just like, okay, this is what your deck is trying to do. I need mm -hmm. to kill it as soon as possible. So getting a death trigger is just like, okay, that's yeah. not so just, bad. You know, thank you. But just like what Mike said in his honorable mentions, there's lots of cards that synergize with it. So you can take the token route or the adventure route, 
and you'll get all of these plus one plus one counters. You could do Pledge of Unity, gain lots of life, and you put two counters on your creature, or Basiris, or Basri, is that his name? Basri's, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Basri's Solidarity, you could use that um, just to get more counters. So yeah, this I, I'm pretty sure this is definitely going to be a deck. Um, we, one card, so this is my number four. So I, I'm just going to talk say now what I was going to yeah. say for my number four. Uh, I agree with everything that you said. This card is insane. Every card that has had this effect so far has been insane in almost every format that it's been legal in. Yep. Like I, there's a hardened scales um, modern deck for sure. Was I, I don't know if there's a legacy deck. I don't know. Yeah. Um. But anyway, so the power level is there. The other card that I think that needs to be mentioned when we talk about is tempered veteran. Mm hmm. Um, so it's a one white, one colorless, one two. You can pay a white and tap it to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature that already has a plus one plus one counter on it. Um, and then you can pay six and tap it to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. Yep. So this guy just starts, you know, as soon as you, once you have both of these in play, you're just adding two plus one plus one counters to a creature every turn. That's, that's very impressive. Mm hmm. Um, they're both two mana too, so yeah. it's just really quick to put it on. I don't think I would play this guy in my deck without the mentor. Yeah. Um, but having the mentor, dude, and this guy just becoming insane, um, I, I think it's worth thinking about. Yeah. Uh, well, I have mine as, as my number two since since you're talking about it now. My mine is number. Two. <laughs> I got that as number two. Uh, I want mentor or veteran. Uh, oh, yeah, concrete mentor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I need this card to work. <laughs> it will. I, it will do lots I, of work for you. I need this. <laughs> I, I I need one last for all with uh, Pledge of Unity. <laughs> I mean, if you think I'm for like plus I'll, with Watley's oh no with uh, Watley's Raptor, please, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh boy. Like I don't, I if it's not competitive, it's okay. But I just want it to work. <laughs> no, I agree with you. It has lots of potential, and it will be in. It will be a deck. Um, but yeah. All right. I think it's what, you next. What, what number are we at? Hold on, Sean. Oh, uh, that was Eric's okay. five. So yeah. Sorry, I thought you cut your off. Five now, Mike. Yeah. My five is like a whole bunch of blue. Blue spells, so like, uh, if, I would call, qualify them under the permission category. Um, so it's lofty denial. No. So okay. yeah, rewind is one of them. Yeah. Um, lofty denial. Uh, let's see, miscast and unsubstantiate. That's not a counter spell. Uh, well, I mean, yes, yeah, it's. it's it's in the blue flavor. Okay, which I one like. do you want to start with? So, um, let's start with Rewind. Rewind is a reprint from... Rewind is a reprint. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, from Urza's Saga, is it? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's been in a bunch of core sets, too. So, this is two colorless blue-blue for counter-target spell and tap up to four, four lands. Um, I don't know. When I saw this card, I, just, I was just thinking Urza's Saga. I was... Cause I used, to, um, I love paying me some permission, and <laughs> um, you know, just you have this and like, um, I'm hoping this uh, Simic Flash deck has some. I mean, this could give the Simic Flash deck some game, um, because uh, it doesn't have cards like um, uh, Night Pack Ambusher. It's just a this card is just a nice way to um, to put stuff. In, uh, yeah. just a nice pillar. Um, let's see. So there's that miscast. Uh, if you go, if you go to, it's one blue for an instant counter target instant or sorcery unless it plays, unless it's controller pays three. So you got a uh, you got a narrowed version of mono leak. I don't think uh, wizards will never print a uh, mono leak in a standard format. So I never say never. <laughs> I we got quench, dude. Out, dude, we well, got quench. Like, ah. <laughs> if they give a fetch land, there'll be a different story. <laughs> so stop. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, like I like this card, but it's hard. I don't know. It's it's hard because I feel like it is competing against um, Mystical Dispute, and Mystical Dispute just automatically sees play in any blue deck. So uh, for those of you who don't know this Mystical Dispute, it's uh. You have your filter on for I only. Do. Yeah. I know. So it's two colorless, one blue for instant counter target spell. Unless it control it pays three, or if it targets a blue spell, it costs two colorless less. So I mean they're both very narrow. I just feel a uh, mystical dispute just for one more mana, it just it it covers everything essentially. So that's that's why like I mean, I do like Miscast, but the thing is, it is competing against Mystical Dispute. I think Miscast is just a sideboard card. You just yeah. bring it in yeah. when you're playing against a deck full of instant sorceries. Like a control deck? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's Miscast. Then the next one, the next is Upsun Unsubstantiate. Um, one color is one blue for instant. Return target spell or creature to its owner's hand. Um... I really like this card when it was released in Eldritch Moon. So, and it ha essentially has utility. So, you can either. It's like, a, what, that Remand? I guess. Is it, mm. is it Remand? Or, yeah. You know? yeah. So, it's either Remand or an Unsummon. So, um, nice. It's a nice temple card against, um, like, a lot of the boot. Well, like, it could be used in a control deck. You can use it in a lot, like, Blue, uh, blue eight flyers, which brings us to our last card, Lofty Denial. Um, one colorless, one blue for instant counter target spell. Let's control it phase one. But if you control a creature with flying, counter that spell unless it's controller it phase four. Uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> so this is this is the closest we get to mono leak with the requirements. So the blue white flyers deck really needed something to help. Um, help it out. So this is one of the cards. Um, this, you know, because uh, yeah, I don't. Know. I, I want this card. I also want this card to work. Yeah, um, you basically have to play this card in a deck with at least like sixteen to twenty plus flyers, yeah, right? So it's only but in, in, that in, deck. in in that specific deck, it's a good card. In it, any yeah. other deck, it's it's terrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like the blue white deck still. I think it has some game because you still have Imperium Eagle for a good few months, mm -hmm. and they just released uh, Watcher, Watcher of the Spheres, which is also yeah. another good card. Yep. Yeah, that one was on Rob's uh, top ten list. Yeah, it wasn't on mine, but. So, um, flying spell, flying creature the flying costs one less, and if when it enters, when a creature flying comes, you just get a nice boost. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, plus, plus. Uh, yeah. So, that is my number five. Alright, well, my number four was Conclave Mentor, so you can skip me. Okay. So, <laughs> I guess we can just start talking about this card. Um, my favorite format is Commander. And in this set, we got lots of cool Commander cards. Um, lots of good reprints. Um, one of those reprints is a green card, and it is... Cultivate. Let me just remove all of these. Cultivate. So, for 3 mana, you get a ramp spell. Um, ramp just means you search your deck for a library, or you search your library for a land and you put it on the battlefield. Um, it was based off the card Rampant Growth, which was the first time it, does, it did that, which is why it's called Ramp. But with Cultivate, you search your library for up to two basic lands. You show those cards to your opponent, and then you put one of them onto the battlefield and one into your hand. So, this is like one of the better ramp cards, just because you're not only ramping as usual, but you also get to put one of those cards in your hand. So, next turn, you have a card to actually play. Um, it's also good because since you're searching up for two lands, it's easier on your mana base, especially if you're going to do like a 2, 3, 4 color deck. So, you can actually search for the colors you're missing or the colors you need. Yeah. The, so, this is my number one. Um, I, I think this card is great. Yep. Uh, the, I, I think what puts this over the top of other ramp 
uh, options that we have available because there's tons of three mana ramp spells in the mm -hmm. format right now. There's like four mana ones Giant. too. Yeah. There's yeah. like Migration Path and Securitas Route. Right. So this one I think is head and shoulders above the rest of them because it costs three, which is important, right? Like you want to cast your ramp spells early to be able to play your mm -hmm. mid to late game stuff earlier. But also the fact that this is card advantage, mm -hmm. right? Like um, ramp and growth, just getting one land is good, but it's not card advantage. Yeah, This is, you're turning one spell into two lands. Mm -hmm. um, and then also having the extra land in your hand, um, because the best uh, ramp spells right now are like Arboreal Grazer and Growth Spiral, where you need to put lands from your hand into play. Mm -hmm. uh, j putting the card into your hand with Cultivate is almost... Th this This is almost as good as a Migration Path, um, but for one less mana. Yeah, and if you think of it with like Arboreal Grazer and... Um... Growth Spiral, you can kind of just... If you have that card in your hand too, it's basically draw a card because for sure you have something to put into the battlefield. Yeah. So like those those Grazer Growth Spiral decks like need to play like a ton of lands in order to make sure that they don't miss their land drops because playing Arboreal Grazer on one, putting an extra land into play and then missing your third land drop is like... Yeah. You, you might as well have not played the Arboreal Grazer, right? But... um. So those decks need to play a bunch of lands to make sure they're hitting every single land drop, and Cultivate helps you do that. Mm -hmm. I take it well, this is on your list too, Mike? This is also my number one, because essentially they gave us Wilderness Reclamation in the Artisan format. Yeah, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that later. So, like, um, just the fact that you still have Wilderness Reclamation, you wrap in, so... And then you have Volcanic Geyser. Mm -hmm. They gave a reclamation. Yep. For the artist format. Why is oh, the yeah, I guess. Yeah. I guess you can okay. Do that. So I forgot that Wilderness Rec We, we might as well talk about my number one, which is Volcanic Geyser and Leafkin um, Avenger. So it's a great. Volcanic Geyser is a great finisher. It's an instant or sorcery. You can put in a control deck, whatever. But yeah, we have three months with re Wilderness Reclamation and. We have two finishers that actually um, interact with it, so it's not unrealistic to make it 12 since we have Wilderness Reclamation. So Yeah, I totally forgot that Rec was legal in Artisan. Yeah, so, so maybe COVID's a good thing so we don't see this mess. <laughs> I'm just saying, if it if it does happen, I'm just saying we don't, we won't have to call something very soon. We might happen. need we might need to make a decision that WotC didn't want to make. So like, yeah. if you think about it, you turn one grazer, you turn two, you turn two uh, cultivate, cultivate. Mm -hmm. you turn or you cultivate or like growth spiral or something. You drop or turn three, you drop. You're dropping wilderness wreck, and then you're just ramping hard, and you just have your control spells, yep. and then you still have miss miss uh, elvish mystic. You still have all the counter magic, all the reboot. Like scorching dragon fire. You, you have, have enough mana for we rewind, so you can counter it during your turn. Back I don't have know. Yeah. Well, the fact that it's all the tools are there, it just, like, yeah, I mean, I don't know about that. <laughs> you want to call it bad non wilderness reclamation? <laughs> I mean, at least we all we all agree with the number one, even though they're all different choices. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is well, those. I mean, trifecta. Rec is the best deck in standard right now, so it would make sense that it's the best deck in Artisan now well, that it has, like, Instant you know, speed payoffs. Mistakes into oh. miracles, I guess. I don't know. If, if Julian is listening to this, there is a deck you play. Well, no. Please, no bully. <laughs> we don't... <laughs> Julian plays this in standard, so why not? There's not much... <laughs> okay, so for, for those listening that don't know what Team of Reclamation is, or that don't know what Wilderness Reclamation is, it's a one green, three colorless enchantment that says at the end of your turn, untap all your lands. And there's a trick that you can do with it where in your end step, you tap all the mana that you have, float, you know, let's say you have eight lands in play, you float eight mana, this trigger resolves, you untap that those all of those lands, and then you have eight more mana from each of those lands. So now you have 16 mana, but you can only use it during your end step. 
So you need to have instant speed payoffs to do that, and that's why Volcanic Geyser being an instant and um, uh, what is it called? Leafkin Avenger having an activated ability that can be instant is relevant. So that's that's what we're talking about for those of you that are unaware. Yeah, oh, and it's black, like Wilderness Reclamation and um, Cultivate our green, so the, and they the only require one green, so it's like splashable. Yeah. Hey, look, we have the four horsemen. This is I mean, the four I, horsemen I, of the you apocalypse. Might as well put, you might as well put Growth Spiral in there. Oh. Yeah. But then it's not four. <laughs> it ruins it. So yeah. like, you we can build a deck right now. Just letting everybody know. <laughs> is this gonna turn from a top ten to like a live deck tech? <laughs> No, we don't need to go down that route. Okay, I don't think so we ever was, want to go down this route. That was, uh, Eric, that was your four. Cultivate was your four. So, Mike, yep. what's your four? Oh, four was oh, Kite Cell Freebooter. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we've already talked about that. Um. So, yeah. Did you want to add anything? Um. Like, I feel like Kite Well, I mean. When I look at it too, like Kaiso Free Booter is also like a nice sideboard piece. Um, it's a, I think it's a, I think it could potentially replace the rest in, um, in Artisan. Um, I think in aggro decks, I would agree with you. So, yeah, yeah. the rest gets rid of the card. This so just slows it down. Yeah, I, I can see the aggro decks not wanting to main deck this because it's not good against everybody. So it might it might be a sideboard card, but it's definitely main deckable. Mm -hmm. And like um, referring to your refer like the mono black the mono black devotion deck would actually would like you can just I think in some cases you can actually replace the rest for Christ of Reaper because it adds to the devotion. Sure. Yeah. So I like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I that's that was that's my thinking going into it. Yeah. And okay. I think, yeah, and I think for most parts, like when they duress your hand, like they can't touch a, like if you have, if you needed some sort of disruption, they can't touch your kite self rebooter, anyways. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Very good card. Very good card. Um. So my number three is a seasoned hollow blade. It is a one white, one colorless, three one. And you can discard a card to tap it and give it indestructible until end of turn. Mm -hmm. um, so this thing is good in aggressive decks, right? A 2 mana 3-1 can become indestructible um, for no mana cost at instant speed, right? So you don't need to turn it indestructible until after they declare blockers or after they point a removal spell at it. So as long as you have a card in your hand threatening to do that, we'll incentivize them from wanting to do those things um and then also like this would be a very good sideboard card if not main deck card for like a blue white control deck right um the for any deck that is going to have a lot of card advantage in it uh you can throw this down early it blocks everything you discard cards um, you live through the early game thanks to this guy, and then you can recoup those cards later because of the time that he bought you. Um, and then, you know, this guy can close the game as well. So it might not even be a sideboard card. This might just be a main deck card in blue-white control. Mm -hmm. um, but this guy plays plays offense and defense very well as long as you have cards in your hand. It's a very, very powerful effect. And then, of course, um, if you just want to build around this guy, Mike, you love your Boggles deck, so... Um, right. Staggering Good. Insight. Staggering Insight <laughs> is still is in the format, you know. So you can do all sorts of stuff with this guy, unless it gets a uh, grasp, grasp of darkness. Mm. Oh yeah, indestructible does not prevent it from dying to state based effects like mm -hmm. having zero toughness. And like the what's that called? Craft the Canarium too, or Pestilent Haze. Those are cards yeah. that affect it, but those are really situational. Um, let yeah, me tell you the reason, card. yeah, let me tell you the reason I like it. So you know how I like reanimate decks, right? Oh, the discard a card. Yeah, you could discard cards to it, so it could be an early game discard outlet. I guess? I feel like that's the easiest part of the reanimate. No, no, I mean, like, well. I just like the idea of that. 
Okay, fair enough. If you want to turn that, um, that called negative part into a positive, this yeah. this is like I think this is the only card with a discard outlet, like a free discard outlet. So there's always opportunity for that. Yeah, something to keep an eye out for. But yeah, the, so the reason this guy is so high on my list is just because I think it it's very flexible. It'll go into a lot of different archetypes and it'll be very powerful in all of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just turns all your like, your lands and your extra land cards that you're handing to is destructible. Yeah. Yeah. Like so that was that was my three. Mm-hmm. So for my number three and for all of these cards onwards, these are what like in draft there's something called mythic uncommons. So like they have the power of uncommons but or they're uncommons but they have the powers of mythics. So this is where like I'm just calling it um rare uncommons. So the first one for my number three is uh Garuk's Uprising. Just because it reminds me of Teamer Ascendancy. It's basically Teamer Ascendancy, but easier to cast. So what Garuk's Uprising does is, when he enters a battlefield, if you control a creature at par 4 or greater, you draw a card. Creatures you control get trample, and whenever a creature with par 4 or greater enters the battlefield, you draw a card. So this basically replaces cards such as Kiora or stuff like that, where if you have a... Um, for a greater deck or like a monster's deck, you can use it to fuel your engine. So, like you play a f you play a big creature, draw a card. Play another big creature, draw a card. So green gets its draw engine. Um, not only that, it gets the benefit of trample, which you obviously want for a big um, big creature deck because it incentivizes your or it doesn't incentivize them, but it kind of doesn't want your opponent to block just because. The damage is probably coming in, and it's not going to be a chump yeah. block anymore. You don't want them to chump. Yeah, but is, this is, is there a two mana? Is there a two mana creature that has four power? Uh, well, we have this thing. We can always search it up. What am I supposed to? I mean, the cost. Um, what is that for? Oh, let's see. I can't sort it by CMC. Well, we can check. If you hit the the option button to the right, no, there there aren't any two. It would no. be in green if it did exist. Yeah, it doesn't look like it. Yeah. So my my biggest problem with this card is that, or I guess the 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 keyword big cards in general is that it just messes with your curve. Mm. Right. Like you traditionally aggressive decks you you know the most important casting cost is one and two mm -hmm. um and if you're like building around this keyword keyword big then like your one and two drops are gonna you know i, I guess you can play like ramp creatures or ramp spells on two and then just try and play like bigger things but well i'll tell you what we can search up power three because we also have Grumgully. Yeah, and Grum then Gully. that'll turn it to a four. Yeah, but then like you're playing Grumgully on three, and then you need to play this, which also costs three. Oh, sure. Right? And then your your curve is just going to hell yeah. once you're you're doing stuff like that. Yeah, but still, so, this is. I agree a card with you that, that it's a very powerful card. Yeah. I also agree with you that it in draft it will probably be very very powerful because just like dropping a bunch of power and toughness over and over in draft is good. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's as good in Artisan. Oh, yeah. We'll see. I think that it will be perfect inside of the green-red deck, and we've seen yeah. that that's I mean, very like effective. The, the, the keyword big deck that we had, I think one of you guys made a video with it, had Furious Rise in it, and mm -hmm. I think this is better than Furious Rise. So yeah. I, I, I do think this is a contender in the format. All right, so that was Eric's three. Mike? Uh, Falconer Adept. Really? Yes. Is this is this your disenchant? No. This guy is expensive. I like the effect, but he's expensive. Sell me on it. Tell, tell me more. No, no, no like sell that. me on it, too. Hey, calm down, calm down. Okay, so Falconer Adept, three colors, one life, or two, three human soldier. When it attacks, create a one, one bird token. That's flying and attack. Um, I don't know. I just feel like it just creates board state. Like when it, of course, when it attacks, you know that's the only thing. But 
Um, I like that idea that it creates board state. Um, but, and then, um, okay, let, let me push back on that point a little bit. This guy costs yeah. four. It's yeah. a two, three, which is really small. And either your opponent is now doing something that's more powerful than putting three power into play. Or they have a 3-3 three, three in play that's going to block this guy. And then you just paid 4 mana to make a 1-1. One, one. That's that's true. Um, I don't know, when I was reading this card for... Well, I mean, like, I I mean it's great card. when your opponent has no board. Yeah. But um, I don't know how often that's going to happen. It'd be good for 3 mana, maybe. If it had haste. If this costs 3 mana, I would like it a lot more. Yeah. There's just something about it. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think Mike just saw the bird token and was like, is this Healer's Hawk? I hope this not. This must be good. I hope yeah. not, because that is a Cons of Tarkir um, character with a Selesnia bird. So that's flavor fail to begin with. Yeah, blasphemy. Yeah, that's the worst. I don't know. I, 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 for me, I like this card. One, like... All right. Prove, yeah, prove me yeah. wrong, Mike. Make make me a Falconer Adept deck and show me. It can show play me the against business. my dude. It can play against my Tutelage deck. Good. You know, it was like between. Yeah. Uh, like, this was. Actually I think the Tutelage deck is going to be favored. I was looking at between this and Vryn's Wingmare, actually. I I oh. like Vryn's Wingmare as a sideboard card. All right, so, we'll give you a Mulligan, Mike. Vryn's Wingmare is Mike's number three. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, in that case, Vrin, you can talk about it because Vrin's Wingmare is my number two. Hey. So, so just because, like, um, one, it's a good, it's good against the control decks, and one, it's also good against the draw two decks, because once you resolve this, like, you know, you're, you're, it's just gonna slow, slow them, slow people down from actually trying to draw at your cards and stuff, or cast knock you. Just, it does affect you too, though. So yeah, you just kind of yeah. kind of have to go straight up aggro. So you play four copies of this, like you just tax it for four, and it makes like a shock cost like five mana to play. Two mana. Uh, let's let's not get ahead of ourselves because if they have a shock, shock's, shock's then gonna it's cost going two. to kill one of them before the fourth one comes into play. Yeah. But I agree with everything else that you said. So, um, um, yes. While we're talking about go. my number two, remember when I said uh, rare uncommons? Yeah. Rin's Wingmare was actually a rare in Origins. Yep. Um, also, it reminds... Not reminds me, but... It's, you know, my, my girl. My girl. My girl Thalia. Where are you? It's Artisan. I don't think she's on Arena. No, she is. Oh, they... they she was in the Historic set, yeah. Yeah. So, it reminds me of Thalia. Um, kind of. It's a 2-mana two 2-1 two, with First Strike and has the same ability as Ring, Wingmare. So it does an impression of Thalia, but this was a card that I was thinking of combining with Freebooter, just because you can scope out their hand and then play Wingmare next turn. So all of their instants and sorcerers are just harder, so removing it makes it harder. Mm. So making some sort of taxes I deck would, was something I that like I would I would like that a lot more if these creatures had better bodies. Yeah. Because like... If if you're investing all these resources into like trying to like slow them down by one turn, like you need a clock to back it up. Mm -hmm. I, I think Vryn's Wingmare is gonna be best in just a straight white aggro deck out of the sideboard. Like you bring it in against anything that is trying to play a bunch of cheap spells. Mm -hmm. And then you like it's just gonna be a speed bump with a lightning rod on its head. But as long as they're spending their their resources killing this instead of like your three one drops that are in play beating mm. them down but um, you can probably also see this with the seasoned um what's her seasoned hollow blade yeah the seasoned hollow blade mm. so yeah i yeah. like i like playing seasoned hollow blade a lot more on turn two than kite sail freebooter because hollow blade is actually a clock mm -hmm. and then ring wing mare is there to protect it as well yeah yeah, I, I agree that this is a powerful card. Mm -hmm. Much more powerful than um whatever that other card name is. <laughs> oh, man. Falconer Adept. There it is, yeah. Hey. Maybe oh, so. It's, it's just so slow. Even if you're going to, like, suit it up or anything, like, 
you're spending a lot of resources to get like a one one every turn. I thought this like, was com a common. Com compare this. It. Compare this to Improbable Alliance, Mike. What are your Improbable? Oh, so when you draw an extra card, you know? yeah. Yeah. Like it costs two. Yeah. And it's not on a super fragile body. And you have like a really easy way to um, activate it. Yeah, That's like true. Falconer Adept is only good when your opponent has no creatures in play and is not doing something overly powerful that attacking them for three with your four mana creature is going to put a significant clock on them. Anyway, I won't rag on you about it anymore. Vryn's Wing Mare, great pick, Mike. Good job. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Man, I really uh, like so Vryn's Wing Mare. I love him. My number two is okay. um, Archfiend Vessel. The, so it's a one black mono for a 1-1 one, one lifelinker. Uh, and it says, if it entered the battlefield or was cast from your graveyard, you can exile it and make a 5-5 five, five black demon creature token. Um... I think that the red black sack deck is probably tier one or tier two in the artisan format right now. And this just slots really well into it because that deck already wants to play call of the De death dwellers. Mm -hmm. um, and so like that deck needs like cheap creatures that they are fine sacking to whatever sack outlets they have weaponize the monsters, which is oven, whatever they just want like cheap cardboard in play, which this does. And then if you have it in your graveyard and you call the Death Dwellers it back, then you just turn it into a 5-5 Demon, which is also great. Um, so I don't know if this is going to go in other archetypes besides that, but I think that that archetype is already very well established, and this is just such a clean fit into that, that it's my number two. So is there anything that activates it besides Call of the Death Dweller? Uh, nothing cheap that activates it besides that. In standard, yeah. there's Luris, but... Well, um, no. That that doesn't count. Yeah. I, that, I don't think there's anything else that's that was cheap. That was my main problem. It was just... The only card I could think of is Death Dweller, and while that's good, and you can, like, choose one other creature... You could choose two Archfiend's Vessels. That's the only thing that, as far as I know, activates it. Right, but the, like... The red black sack deck is already playing like three or four Call of Death Dwellers because it goes so well with um, Mayhem Devil and the rest of their deck. And yeah. then, yeah, I, I just think that this is a free roll in that deck because you want like cheap one, you know, one mana dudes that you're fine sacrificing. Oh, no, I agree with that, but you know, just kind of feel yeah. bad that it's a 1 1 with lifelink. Right. I mean, if it gets brickwalled, then it's just sitting around waiting to be sacrificed. Yeah, yeah. Which that deck is completely fine doing. Mm-hmm. No, I gotcha. That was just my only concern with it. Yeah, it's a fair concern. I wish there were more, but I, I think that Call is a very powerful one. Yeah. So You're obviously not going to, like, Rise of the Dead it or something like that. Yeah. Blood for Bones. Yeah. And... The other thing too is, I mean, it's still it's still a good card if you reanimate it, but if you call it the Death Dweller, it you don't get the um, Death Touch from it. The Death Touch of the you can't target that, right? Because it you, you can't it. target the token, but yeah. you can target the other thing that you bring back with Call. Yeah, the yeah, Death yeah, Dweller. yeah. But just just you can't you can't get a five five Death Touch Menace Demon. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, just just in case every anyone's wondering. Alright, so that was my number two. Uh, uh my number two was Vryn's Wing Mare. We already went through that. My okay. number two was the Conclave, so we went through that. Oh, yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Alright, uh so my number one was Cultivate. We've already talked yep. about that. <laughs> What's your number one? Mike? Mines? Yeah. Oh, yeah, Eric's Eric's number one was Volcanic Geyser, which which basically means cultivate and wild or wilderness reclamation. Yeah, well, the wilder, wilderness reclamation has infiltrated uh, artisan. It's infiltrated M twenty one. That is the number one card. Yes. 
too. But yeah, I think we're all in agreement that something with Cultivate and Volcanic Geyser and like ways to put or ways to make a mana will be probably a tier one deck, right? Yep. Yeah. Wait, yeah. It, Mike, are you saying Wilderness Wreck is your number one card? I mean, it should. I mean, it's not an M21 card, but it might as well should be. <laughs> For real? You put it as your number one card? That's so funny. <laughs> no, I, I like. I was just thinking Reclamation the whole time. Yeah. I was just, like, it's just that, like, the um, the geyser. Yeah. Okay. And, like, like, I remember we had this conversation a couple of videos ago. Like, Wilderness Reclamation would be good if it had something to top end. Yep. Geyser... Yeah. That it, geyser is the top end. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. I mean, but it's like, a good thing that usually they do this, right? They, um, at the very end of a standard rotation, they'll put all of the good cards that come together, just so you have three months to play with super broken stuff, and then you restart the rotation. This, yeah. this is what we have. Yeah. So next set that comes out, Zendikar Rising will rotate out. Um, what is it? M twenty. Uh, War of the Spark, all of the guilds, Allegiance, yeah. and Guilds of Ravnica. But we have until October. <laughs> uh, okay, before before we wrap up, we should talk about um, uh, Rob's three cards that we haven't talked about yet yeah. that were on his list. So his number 10 was Chandra's Pyreling. Mm -hmm. It's a two mana, one red, one colorless for a 1-3. Whenever your opponent is dealt non-combat damage, it gets plus one plus zero and gains double strike until end of turn. I think, um, you know, if you're playing a red aggro deck, like, obviously you're playing Shock and Skewer the Critics and stuff like that. Um, so turning this on should be easy. The the new Chandra's Rag Mutt, or whatever it's called, mm -hmm. would also turn this one? on every turn. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I could see this thing getting huge. You could also put, like, Barge in on it and give it Trample and buff it up. So uh, sure I can see this card being very powerful. Uh, his, his next card that we didn't yet talk about was Pestilence Haze. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Pyreling was his number 10. Pestilence Haze is his number... Yeah, his number nine. nine. Yeah, so black, black, colorless. Uh, you choose all creatures get minus two, minus two until end of turn, or remove two loyalty counters from each Planeswalker. Um, just having a sweeper that can also hit Planeswalkers, mm -hmm. um... Especially since we're flexible. losing Cry, Cry of the Canarium. Yeah, yeah, it, Cry is rotating out in October. It had this is a, another great option for against aggro decks. Yeah. Um, so Pestilence Haze was his number seven. We already kind of talked about the um the Watcher, the Watcher, the Spheres, the Flyer payoff, and then the last one is Jeskai Elder. Jeskai Elder is a reprint. It's a one blue, one colorless for a one two prowess. And whenever it hits a player, you may draw a card. If you do, then you discard a card. So, you if know there what? is like a Query and Dryad deck, then this might go in it. Yeah. You know me, I like my um, Is It Blitz. This should have been on my list. Yeah. I really like it. <laughs> and I, I played with this when I started because I started in cons. Yeah. I'll, I'll definitely make this a... Rob, I got you. I'll turn this into my brew series. I'll, I'll make one. Yeah, I think it has potential. You just gotta find the right balance of um, cheap spells to trigger prowess. Right. And then, like, stuff to do. Okay. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I'm excited for this format. We'll see if... Um, when you're brewing, keep in mind that you need to... Um, kill team or reclamation before they get absurd amounts of mana yep you know what here we got one for you we got this was on my honorable mentions let's just talk about this hey look thrashing brontodon you can destroy team yep. or reclamation or you can destroy reclamation yeah but i mean like the rest of their deck is still reasonable without reclamation so oh, no i know i know focusing on that no i'm just showing so a I, card I think, that's good to put in i think like playing counter spells like negate and you know cancel type effects will be good against ramp decks like that yeah um and then also just playing uh and a fast aggressive deck mm -hmm. like they'll probably be playing flame sweep 
so you need to keep that in mind. But if you play a fast aggressive deck that can kill them before they get um, their setup done, then that's another way to attack that deck. Yeah. So you know we're we're high on that deck right now, but it is by no means unbeatable. So the gauntlet is there. Yeah. Oh. Cool. I don't want to see. All it. right, gentlemen, it's getting late. We should wrap this up. Yep. Thank I you, think we're everyone, at 150. for sticking around. Yep. Yeah. So uh, let us know what you think. Let us know what brews you're excited to play with. And then let Eric know what decks he needs to make videos on. Yeah, no, give it to me. I want to make all of the fun decks. Yeah. We'll, we're, we'll do our best to try and get more video content up on the channel. Now that it's summer. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. We are done. Peace. Right, take care. See you guys. Peace.